And I said to myself, I'm never not going to take a shot ever again. Everything's going to be about taking the shot because I don't want to have regret. Right? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Is it too blue steel? So true to form to my relationship with my guest today is that uh, he's late and I'm waiting on him. And I find that hilarious some 20 years later <laughs> some things never change <laughs> oh god this is so great <laughs> i love it well, i love, I love to see where the magic happens can i tell you something because we've been friends for a very long time yes yeah you make me so happy your laugh is like it just makes me happy whenever i think of you i just get this warm feeling and it just it just makes me happy and yeah. it's, it's, I love that. And thank you. And it's so funny. You're going to make me cry because I'm an emotional <laughs> dumpster fire right now. But I feel the exact same way about your laugh. I can't hear it and not just be overrun with joy because it's just so childlike and amazing. <laughs> no, I love no, it. Now I'm nervous about it. Now. So you got to cover my mouth and I do, do all these. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, let me give you a little background. So, I wanted to do this personal project, so I'm just, I'm recording them as videos and I'm recording the audio as a possible podcast. So yeah. I know a lot of really cool people, company included, that have done some really incredible things in their lives. And it's not necessarily the path they started out in in life, but they followed it and they are doing really cool things. And so my hope is to inspire people to not be discouraged or hang on to the idea of what they thought their life would be like, but see where it goes and see where it can take you and embrace that wonderful, weird journey. You have no idea how close that is to my current world right now and some of the things I'm working on. Like, it's actually really, really cool that you, that you bring that up. And I'm, I'm excited to you just take me down the path you want me to go and I'll start yabby, yabby. I'll go yabby, yabby. <laughs> Well, I was think I was trying to pinpoint when I actually met you because I knew of you long before we were friends because we're both from Newfoundland. Were you born in Newfoundland? I was born in Kitchener, Ontario, uh, but I grew up in I grew up all my life in Newfoundland. Right, yeah. and I could I didn't think you were born there, but I couldn't remember what the story was. So I knew you from just us existing in the same area, and we had some overlap in our friend groups. And of course, you were uh, a member of a popular band at the time of shows I would frequent. Uh, R.I.P. Bucket Truck, you were amazing. <laughs> but we weren't friends until probably the mid two thousands. So it was my la I came to do my apprenticeship with you through university in I can't remember if it was 2003 or 2004, but it's roughly around I met you before that. So I'm thinking I know the place I lived. So it was roughly around 2002, I think, when I met you and then we became friends. It was through the members of Thumb. Oh, my God. So it was. Yeah, I remember. Well, I knew it was Chris Petal, who is a fr mutual friend of ours, but yep. I forgot about that band. Yep, and Chris was uh, – love Chris. You know, lo yep. love love the members were so good, like such good people. And uh, you were hanging out. You were friends with Chris. And I remember being right. through engagements together. And we, that's uh, right. That's how we became friends, right? Our, our personalities are kind of akin because we're both a little crazy. <laughs> right? So it's true. You know, crazy sees crazy. We're like, oh, crazy. And then we yeah. go off and be weirdos together. Yes. And it's like creative crazy. So that's a special kind of crazy. Oh, yeah. Thing. Like I had like, especially when you started showing me some of your, your work and I was like, Oh my God, it's just so <laughs> talented. Right. Yeah. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the time that we worked together. I don't remember exactly how long it was just a couple of you, months. You were ready to kill me because I was trying to whip you into shape for real. I, was gonna say, stuff, right? I feel like you were probably ready to kill me as well because I was nowhere near up to par that I should have been. <laughs> No, you did great. You did great. Oh. I was just, I was just a brute. Like I was, I was just trying to get you ready. You know. Well, I wouldn't. I didn't find you particularly hard. I found I was really angry with the my school system for not preparing me for the actual work world. Like in our 
class structure. It's like, okay, you have a week to do this project. And then once I started working at an actual design internship, it was like, okay, I need this by five and it's three 30. Yeah. And like those kinds of things were like, I just, I literally went in every day thinking I was going to be fired because I was not, <laughs> I was not ready to be in the workforce. Yeah. It, you know, a lot of it comes down to, you know, I was just learning the programs and stuff. Right. And that's, I, that's one thing I really don't like about modern institutional like schools and that type of stuff. It's, I don't feel like there's a focus on really preparing, you know, and I, I agree with you. And I, but I don't think, I think that's for everybody. You know, yeah. Everybody, when they graduate, there's very few people that come out of school and they're like, oh yeah, I'm ready to work. You know, you basically are like, oh, you're smart. You've learned a bunch of things. Now we have to get you back into reality. You know, I had a friend of mine, he was telling me the story about one of his new employees and the employee was like, listen, I'm just not feeling like coming in today, right? And he's like, hmm, you know, maybe I'm just not feeling like paying you, <laughs> right? You know, like, this is not a school project. You have to come to work, right? You know, that kind of, you know, so there's, there's a lot of that type growing up stuff that um, I don't think that they, like, I don't know if no anyone can help you get, there's a lot to get through even in four years, I guess, I don't know. I don't know it's true. About. Yeah. I, yeah. I do think there needs to be more of an emphasis on that last year of meeting those kind of different deadlines. Like, yeah, school is hard. You have multiple subjects and things like that. But that that's what blew me away the most about my internship with you is that I just felt so horribly unprepared to be in an actual work environment. And then it was even harder because I didn't want to disappoint my friend. But I really appreciated how we were able to have our work relationship. And then work would end and we had our friend relationship. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. That was I loved it. I loved it. That was really important to me because I was scared of losing you as a friend in the process of bringing you into work. That was a it's big true. concern of mine. I think it was giving to ground. We talked yeah. about it, didn't we, at the very beginning? Said, Listen, I'm going to do this, right? And I've got the okay to do this. But here's like, we cannot let this affect um, us being friends. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. We could hate each other during the work days and then we would go to a movie and it would be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I actually don't know a lot about you like pre that time that we mm -hmm. met. So what what did you want to do in high school? Like when you were graduating, what was your plan that you were going to go tackle? I feel like it was engineer, but I could be wrong. So, OK, so I'll, t I'll give you kind of the background. The two things I wanted to do was I wanted to be a musician, obviously. That was my big-time passion. Still to this day, there's always a part of me that just would rather play guitar than do anything else, right? Um, and write songs. That's that's my favorite <laughs> thing. Um, but the other part of me that was really, really excited was in filmmaking. And I never got to do... I Well, I, I did... I guess I did get... I did get to do some of it uh, with Bucket Truck when we opened up our video production company. Like, I did videos for... Um, a bunch of folks from the no effects label and you know we did a bunch of that stuff too i forgot all about those videos weren't they fun yeah no. the, the animated ones right so we did a bunch of animated ones yeah. and uh we did a bunch of live action ones too and we kind of started our because nobody knew kind of how to talk about our band because there were no hardcore bands <laughs> well i mean there were some i shouldn't say that but there was like the video it was a different part, genre. yeah it was a different genre and they and everyone kind of tried to figure out what to relate us to and they couldn't they couldn't do it. And eventually we're like, I'm sick of people getting this wrong. Let's do it ourselves. Right. Um, for better or for worse, at least then it'll feel like it's us instead of somebody else. Um, you know, so I'll, I can talk you through my trajectory. If you want to hear a little bit about that. I, d I definitely want to hear what your trajectory was then and then talk about where you are now. So I was playing uh, guitar like all the time and I had an opportunity for a scholarship into the music at Mun. Right. Or sorry, at Dow. Sorry, at Dow. And uh, my dad wouldn't let me take it. And he was really convinced that I needed to go into something that was more stable. And, you know, there's some good and bad to that. Like, I'm not saying that all those decisions are good or bad. You know, there's good and bad in all those decisions. But he kind of pushed me towards engineering. And I was like, well, you know, I'm good at math and physics. So, OK, so I'm going to go in engineering. I went in engineering and then the band started to take off. Right. And the decision was to move to uh, Halifax and when we were in St. John's, right? And uh, we moved to Halifax, and then I had to stop engineering with one year left. So I don't have a degree. I finished with one year, like I stopped with one year left. 
And I ended up working at uh, a couple different places. So I had, oh, well, I guess I should talk a little bit about Newfoundland too. Before we left, I was at this really wonderful company called Telepix um, uh, by some, you know, a serial entrepreneur that was running that shop in, in St. John's. And he, I was the sixth employee. Like it was a very small shop that went from six people to like hundreds of people within, you know, no time, <laughs> like zero to 60 right away. And uh, I had the opportunity to stay there. Uh, and not go back to school. And my dad and my brother said, no, go back to school. Stay in school. Keep finishing your school. That company then sold for $30 million and blew up to this monster company. So I lost out huge on that opportunity. And and I remember going to see, I can't remember which band it was, but I remember I didn't have bus fare. I had to get put on the guest list because I, I ran out of money for my end of year term stuff. And my family were poor. So the money I had was the money I had type thing, right? So I walked, you know, for 45 minutes to downtown from where I lived, uh, got in the show and bumped into one of, my, one of my old colleagues who had just bought a house and he was hired way after me, right? So I was like, what do you mean by you bought a house? What are you, what are you talking about? You don't have any money. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, none of us have any money. What are you talking about? And he's like, no, the company sold. You know, my equity is now, you know, and I was able to cash in a little bit. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, <laughs> That was a bad decision. Oh my god! That's, that's an important lesson. Yeah, important lesson, right? You know, and and I was I did a lot of really integral things to help that company succeed. You know, I was I was working really hard on uh, on you know because there was only six guys. So even though I was on there on a work term, I uh, I was doing a lot of stuff. And and this the C level team, uh, which was again six people. So the the executive team was recognized that and were going to offer me a decent amount of equity. So I would have made out very well if I had stayed, right? So big hit, first big hit. And then I and then after that I was going to Halifax and I was like, well you know what I need to work. You know, right now I need to get some cash together. Uh, the band's getting started and I need to work. And I was fortunate enough to get my first job at Extreme Communications, right? Which is now arrivals and departures in Halifax. Mm. And that job, again, four people. And I got to work with some brilliant creative uh, people that have all done inc incredible things. What were you hired there for? What was the yeah. job? So to basically help them set up their technology uh, um, and like, uh, uh, you know, media department, right? Uh, what background did you have in that going from like an engineering student into communications and technology? Okay. So yes, yeah, so this is the other part. See, I'm missing all, you're basically uncovering all my skeletons, right? <laughs> So um, Judd, Judd was my bass player in Bucket Truck. Judd, mm -hmm. could be one of the best designers in the world. That's how Fantastic. I came up. Yeah, he's in, literally incredible genius creative, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Judd was my teacher. So for, I basically, when I was at, I did a work term at my brother's company, which was the worst work term I've ever done, just saying. <laughs> work, working for family is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, love my brother, but worst work term I've ever done. Um, so I was <laughs> working for him. And, you know, the job was like, go run the cables in the ceiling for our stereo unit. Now go design a website. I was like, design a website? I don't know what I'm doing. And then the next part would be, now go build the website. Now go run those cables again. Could you pick up my laundry? You know, it was just like, it was, a, it was literally the worst experience I've ever had because everything was terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't know what I was doing right out of, you know, still in school and just, you know, typical... And en engineering at Mun is one of those things where, like, you get thrown to the wolves. Like, you got to learn how to fend for yourself. So it was like, okay, this is my job. This is what I got to do. So the first thing I did was, I don't know how to design websites, right? I have no idea what. It, I was like, Judd designs websites. He does all this stuff. He does all these design things, right? So I basically every day uh, was with him and another friend of ours, uh, Deanna Norman, uh, who's a, a wicked technolo talk technology person, really smart. I would sit down with them every day for hours. And I don't mean like a couple hours. I mean hours. Every day they get a phone call from me saying, I'm trying to do this thing. I don't know how to do it. And they would talk me through it. And I did that for uh, not even when I was just at Telepix and, and sorry, when I was at Blue Drop, I did that for uh, like basically two years. <laughs> I got a free education out of, out of for design uh, uh, working with Judd. And, um, and truthfully, that's how I got my, that's how I started. When I went to see Telepix and I had my portfolio, I had done all these, like all this uh, photo editing and photo manipulation and all this other stuff as part of just kind of trying to make 
uh, you know, stuff for work, but then that transitioned into show posters and transitioned into, you know, all, you know, swag and album covers and all this other stuff. So they're like, you're an engineer. And I was like, yeah, I'm an engineer, but you know, it's like, but you've done all this other things. He's looking at my portfolio and he's flipping pages. He's like, what? You know? And I said, yeah, I said, well, I, that's just something I've been doing, but you know, I'm applying for an engineering work term. He goes, okay, you have an engineering work term. Uh, and we'll sign off, but you're going to be a designer. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I remember, I remember it was Carl Kenny, right? And Carl was like, you're going to be a designer because you're a designer. And I was like, okay, I'm a designer. <laughs> you know, I was like, I guess I'm a designer. <laughs> so for there, I was working on all these systems and designing systems and experiences and working through workflows. But then I would go build them afterwards, right? So I was kind of getting the, the again, a crash course in uh, web development through the through a fantastic experience working for a genius entrepreneur and a fantastic team. So that's, that was the first thing, right? Then when I went to, when I went to Halifax, I started applying for uh, development positions and uh, you know, there weren't any because there was no web, like no one was marketing on web at the time. It was 1998, 99. I was going to say, yeah, when's, yeah, late nine. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Like at the beginning stages, right. Yep. You know, where people were still like, oh, this web thing is just a, it's just a little knickknack thing that we're going to, you know, <laughs> literally that's how people would talk about it. I'm like, uh, that's my career. So, uh, thank you. Please shut up now. Right. <laughs> well, it's amazing how many people weren't online until this pandemic hit and they had no choice but to move their business online or not have business. And that's 20 years later, right? With that gap. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. Continue. So, um, so then what ended up happening was, was that, uh, I was fortunate enough to have that portfolio. And the portfolio had grown, and now I had done, um, you know, a bunch of telekit telepix uh, properties. I'd done some stuff for my brother, and now I had built full systems, right? Or had been part of teams that built systems, depending on the, you know, where I was, um, that were substantial, right? So when I went in to meet with uh, 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 Paul uh, at Extreme at times, so he was running at the time. Now he's much bigger than that. He's doing he's a pretty impressive guy. Um, I went to meet with him and I had shown him all this stuff and he said, great, you know what we need to do? We want to build um, like a, a web and media department, like a digital department. Would you, would you head that up? And I was like a kid. So I was like, yeah, of course. In my head, I'm like, this is dumb. What am I doing? Right. You know, now I'm thinking back like, are you kidding me? Like I had no idea what I was doing, but Paul was a really great, uh, he was a really great leader. Truthfully, like a really good leader for his company. And I had, James Rothenberg, who eventually worked for me, uh, a brilliant creative leader. Like I was looking at his stuff. And actually the reason why I had two or three different offers because of my portfolio at the time, but I went to work at Extreme because I wanted to work with James. James's work was just, it was really good. And also we had Grant Hillier. Grant Hillier was like, you know, lead concept artist for Ubisoft, you know, eventually and like, <laughs> like doing all this. And at the time he was just like, I'm a graphic designer. That was one of the best illustrators ever, <laughs> you know, incredible, uh, incredible creative. Right. And then we also had Stephen Bishop, who again was a brilliant designer, right. Also from Newfoundland and part of the punk rock community. And I really admired him. Right. So that was the team. I was like, are you kidding me? I get to work with these guys. It's crazy. Right. So I, I went and started working again, showing my age right at the time. Uh, lots of learning lessons and lots of things that I was taught, things I probably shouldn't have done, things I should have done. Um, but one of the things that happened was there was no, like, no one knew how to run a digital project at the time, right? And, uh, you know, one of the sales reps, uh, which I think was, like, the, the last person on the team, was, like, all of us, Paul, and a sales rep. That's how big the company was at the time. And, well, and a controller, right? Um, he had sold in a project that was literally impossible to get done in the time frame that we had had it very common situation and i was also still pretty young you know still learning right and uh all of a sudden we went from okay uh you know here's this thing that's signed to be like here's this thing that's signed and you have to deliver it in 30 days and it was for the halifax business award and my my tenure there uh at extreme at the time was only six of us remember i was doing 80 hour weeks week after week you know there was no break it was just there was good and bad in that i just want to be clear like i was definitely like getting frustrated being a young person doing those kind of hours um because i wanted to have a life right obviously right um and i was really focused on the band and truthfully the 
you know, that was not a good thing in that mix. Like it was kind of like banned. <laughs> You're going to work. <laughs> you know, I was like, yes, I understand, but I need to go on tour for, you know, but I'll, I'll work on the road. And they were like, you need to go to work. I was like, and so we, there was starting to be a bit of that conflict stuff. And the band was starting to get some more attention. We started to do more tours and I had to kind of be like, mm, I need to find a place that's going to allow me to do this. Cause this is all I really care about. Even though I was in this incredible environment with these incredible creative people doing these incredible things. And I kind of had this uh, really awesome opportunity. I was really focused in the other aspect, right? So I, I decided to leave. And part of the decision, which you're going to laugh about this, was I was working on the Halifax Business Awards, the first one. I think it was the first. I think it was the first one. It was one of the first ones, right? And um, one of the companies that was getting profiled was Kaleidoscope. And my filmmaking side said, "Oh my God, it's a TV company that deals with technology." That seems like a good fit for me because I want to. I want to be a storyteller. I want to direct. I want to write narratives. I want to do all these other things that are not coming out in my current job, right? Where I'm just building stuff. So I went and I met with. I remember I my brother hopped me up. This is kind of funny. My brother hopped me up. He actually was like, "Okay, you're going to go for this job interview." And it's like. You tell them this, and you've done this. And I walked in. M.A. must have thought, like, and M.A. is a very good friend, like, now. But I'm sure he thought I was just absolutely crazy. Because <laughs> right? I walked in, I was like, you're going to hire me, and this is why you're going to hire me. You know, and M.A. was just like, oh, my God, what is this crazy person in my office with all this stuff, right? You know, but I had done, we had done so much uh, work like I had probably at the time was like <laughs> I had like 60 or 70 properties I had built uh, either by myself or with within a team mm -hmm. and had uh, either and had designed them in part or had you know or had impacted design right and creative and experience so so all of a sudden he was like oh yeah you're hired and I was like okay and I had to go and I remember I was so nervous going to tell Paul that I, I was going to go leave and I was I was trying to explain to him it wasn't like I really loved extreme I it was a fantastic but um, but I was burning out and I, and, and I really wanted, I did want to focus on my band. And the other part was that, um, you know, I had, uh, uh, I really wanted to be a storyteller. I really wanted to have like a bit more influence in terms of that way. So I thought, you know, I would go work at Kaleidoscope and then eventually become a director and do that never happened, <laughs> you know, but I did get to infuse a lot of that creative storytelling into the digital part of it. That's right. And that's where I met you as the creative director at Kaleidoscope. And I actually didn't realize the focus was television. I was thinking it was media and then it developed into television, but that's where it started, was it? Yeah. So they had originally created the first ever digital process for animation, you know, and MA is kind of funny. Like he's so modest. And I was like, no, no, no. Nobody in the world was doing that. It was you. <laughs> you know, you came up, you guys, I'm not saying him specific, but that team. Mm -hmm. I'd come up with this uh, kind of approach and I was fortunate enough to be there for it, you know, like be there as part of it and, and help with some of that stuff. And it was a really, really uh, incredible experience, you know, in that way. And, uh, but what that did was once you have all these digital assets, thousands of things that were typically, you would have to go through incredible processes to prepare them for web, right? Now we're all ready to go. You know, we just had to figure out how to optimize and how to, turn them into specific experiences where people could be part of the story, right? So I did that for eight years. And that was the that was one of the best creative jobs anyone could ever imagine. We had a hundred brilliant artists all working on these you know fantastic uh, series shows. They were incredible projects. I mean the CBC Rock Camp and all these under the bed adventures and just so many that it was very diverse too, which was really interesting. And and MA was such a good boss, and Steve was a good boss too. You know, they're they, interesting, they, that interesting duo. <laughs> yes, they're quirky ducks, right? You know, but but that's that's the thing. Like the thing, the thing that I realized with them both because they they had MA was like uh, love. Steve Steve had took a bit of heat from time to time, right? But but part of it is is that they just had a vision. You know, they had a very succinct vision, and uh, truthfully, when people didn't meet with. Um, the same enthusiasm, excitement, or, you know, that type of thing. It hit the hit both of them different ways. Right. So, uh, but I had a great, like I had a great relationship with both of them and they would, 
And the first thing I said when I came for the job is, I'm a musician. I'm going to tour, and that's it. If you want me, this is how you're going to get me, right? Like, I was, I was a, just my brother had me hot, like, like, I felt like I was hopped up on, like, I was a crazy person walking in for this interview in this way. And I mean, went, okay, because he was a musician too. <laughs> Steve's a musician. So mm -hmm. they were both like, you need to tour? We got you. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like crazy. So, so they, so that's why I stayed there for eight years and I had a wonderful experience. And then towards the end, you know, 80 hours a week, every week I was in, I was, I'm, I'll never forget touring with the laptop in my lap, working, you know, driving across the Saskatchewan and then trying to find like a Wi-Fi hotspot that I could access because everyone left their Wi-Fi hotspots open. You know, there was a moment and the guys, I think the guys may even have a photo of this. I'm standing with my computer over my head in the middle of traffic, trying to upload a couple hundred megs worth of files, which at the time is not, you yeah. know, so, and there's cars going past me on opposite sides. I'm just standing there with my laptop in the air in the middle of the street, trying to get something back to my team while I was on tour, you know? So I, one, one clear memory I have from that time was a testament to how hard you worked. And it was actually terrifying for me to be coming into this industry and seeing the amount of work you were putting in. It was like, I don't know if I can do this. I came to work one morning, I guess it would be around 9 a.m. when we would start. And you, no, it might've been earlier. But anyway, you had been sleeping on the couch in the office. So you literally roll like a zombie with your pillow and blanket <laughs> into your office, put it down, sit at your desk, and remain working and you probably worked till like three or four in the morning couple hours quick sleep and then right back to work it was like this guy's a machine <laughs> <laughs> but that's not i mean i'm not proud of that in a way now no, like, it's you, know? you couldn't maintain that long term and you did that for a long time 10 11 years probably yeah but i i'll tell you the thing about it was was it was kind of like the 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 band you know and i and this actually stems from a few other things right um I didn't want to let anybody down ever. I couldn't do it. Like MA trusted me, right? He hired me and he and he trusted me and he gave me this big opportunity where I was, you know, leading, helping him lead his company. First employee one, essentially. Like, you know, after there was a bit of an uh, insurrection that happened where some people were there and then they weren't there and then I was like I helped, I was the one guy that was there, <laughs> you know, to help them rebuild that. So I uh, I really took that into account and I always kind of looked at every company as um, a band, you know, it's it, it, same thing as my guy, our guy, our band was together for 11 years because we all cared about each other. We wanted, we wanted to make sure everyone was okay. Right. So I would take that same um, emphasis on myself to make sure that everybody had what they needed. It didn't miss anything. If someone wasn't able to do something, I would do it for them. Right. You know, and truthfully what, the, what happened was everyone started to have that same, mindset where they were all like oh this person needs help it created like a bit of an empathetic uh environment like you never you never missed a deadline when you were with me i don't know if you know that right i didn't but that's great to hear <laughs> yeah you know because and you put in some a lot of extra hours you know and and that's not to say that that's what you want to do but if everyone is really passionate about what they're doing it's a very different feeling and and even what i'm doing now that's what it feels like it feels like everyone's just like we got to do this. And it's like, yeah, we got to do this together, <laughs> you know, and I'm not putting in this, no one's putting in those hours like that anymore. Thank God. But, um, but there is that commitment that if they had to, I know they would. Right? Yeah. It's a big difference with work when it's, when it's something you're passionate about, which is what you hear all of these life coaches and business coaches talking about these days. Like if you find your passion and go for that, I wouldn't go so far to say you'll never work a day in your life because that is just a bullface lie. But yes. it's it's still work, but you you have a lot easier time putting in what's required and going above and beyond when it's something that you're passionate about that you believe in. When you're smiling at work, it's a very different environment than when you are stressed and just mm -hmm. purely stressed. When you're smiling because you're like, oh, I got work on this really cool thing, and you can kind of focus on that part of it. Oh, you okay, sweetie? <laughs> Okay. Oh, it's okay. It's okay, Mama. Can you close the door, Mama? Thank you. I love you. <laughs> you know how cute she is now. It's like she's gorgeous, and you are going to hate your life in ten years. Uh, no, I will murder everybody. That's that's you know you'll see me in jail, and that's where it's going to be because that's my little girl, and that's how it is. Um, 
So, uh, yeah. So uh, now, now, now that I've testified to that publicly, I think that's <laughs> I'm going to hang on to that because I feel like I'm going to need it someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but, but I really, I really loved like Kaleidoscope was really special, you know, and I, I had a great experience at extreme. I had an incredible experience with Telepix and I had an incredible, even with my brother's work, like my brother was very successful, spent lots of, I learned a lot from every, yes, yes. I learned a lot from all of them, like kind of coming up. Um, But uh, truthfully, when I was at Kaleidoscope, it was my first moment of like, oh no, 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 this is on you. (laughs) You know, at the end of the day, all this revenue that you have is solely on you. You know, you can't lean up to whoever else that you need to talk to, the results are, are completely impacted by you. Right. And I was like, I'm not letting this guy down. He gave me a shot. Right. And, uh, so I was there for eight years. And then in the eighth year, I was some weird, you know, whatever stuff happened. And I started to feel like I shouldn't be there anymore. Right. You know, I didn't feel like I was, I didn't feel that same, uh, I didn't feel like I was part of it. I felt like something something had changed, right? And I won't go into that because that's a whole different, whole different story. So I'm not going to air, air, air that. That, air that, that happens. Ooh, yes. Um, so I went in and I passed my letter of resignation. And the uh, CTO also, which was my business partner in my next phase of my life, uh, said he said he would. He basically was like, if you're leaving, I'm leaving too. And I was like, really? <laughs> right? I was like, but I'm not, I don't know where I'm going. I was going to go work at a restaurant, right? And he was like, no, let's go do something together because we were, we, we were akin in a lot of ways. So we went and started uh, Raised Performance Media, which was actually named after Raised Fist, the band originally. You remember that? Right. And that's yeah. the last email I had for you, which was why I was like, I don't even know where to send this link anymore. That's well, really funny, isn't it? But, yeah. but, but we started that like, you know, geez, it would have been 2006, 2005, 2006. And I just left uh, Kaleidoscope and we had no credibility. Yeah, I should say we had. No, that's not true. We had oodles of credibility, right? But as I, individuals, as individuals, and in the ecosystem of technology in Halifax, uh, but everyone kept looking at me like, "Okay, little kid with the dreadlocks." Okay, you know, <laughs> and I was getting a bit of that. And then I also felt like there for the business at the time in Halifax, pretty racist. Not gonna lie, right? There was a lot of the old boys club. It's like, all right, little fella, go on now, right? A lot of that. Really? Yeah, oh yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. And I was like thinking to myself, how am I going to do this? You know, now now, now I'm not just doing these crazy, like we didn't have a customer at Kaleisco for eight years. Everything I did was like, oh, we have a $7 million animation production. Uh, Mike, go, go figure out how to bring in a $2 million Canadian media grant, you know, concept, right? And then MA and I would work on the applications and we'd submit it and we'd bring in money to do projects. So I didn't have a customer. I was my own customer, right? right. You know? <clears throat> so now I had to go do sales. I had to go talk to all these people. And they were definitely treating me differently. And I could feel it. And I remember thinking to myself, hmm, we, you know, because we're now surviving on my credit card. So we had stipends. Me and Andrew were doing stipends on my credit card, right? So a thousand bucks a month each to just pay our bills. And I had, thankfully, because we had run video productions on my credit card, I had probably close to $100,000 of credit for a 20-something-year-old, or 30-year-old, I guess, at that point. Right. You know, um, but that's how we were surviving. And I was like, I have to figure this out quickly because uh, eventually I have to pay that back. And, uh, you know, so, <clears throat> so we were building up. We built up this wacky website. We'd done all these types of things to kind of set up a, a footprint. And uh, what had happened was I was like, well, where do folks like me get work? Where do folks that look like me get work, right? Because uh, it's not here. And I... Uh, it's- See, that, this is shocking to me, and I, I, it shouldn't be, but it's something we have never, ever talked about. Yeah, that was a really challenging time uh, in my youth uh, because I was, uh, i just taken another giant risk, you know? And my initial uh, not taking the risk at Telepix, which, you know, which I should have stayed on as a team member, I would have been, you know, we would have been having very, very different, <laughs> a very different lifestyle now, right? 
um, was a mistake. And I said to myself, I'm never not going to take a shot ever again. Everything's going to be about taking the shot because I don't want to have regret. Right. So, uh, so long story, sorry, coming back around again. So here I am. I'm like, where do guys like me go get work? And I was like, well, I could go to LA, but I've had experiences in LA from the band and from a few other things. And I was like, I don't fit LA. I just don't, I, I, they, it doesn't, um, I couldn't find my, my, my motley crew <laughs> there. Right. Everything felt very forced. Um, but in New York, it fits. Right. So I went to New York and I sold my first project. I, actually, I sold three projects on my first sales mission. And here's how I did it. I would send emails to info at, uh, actually it was four in the first info at whatever the company was info at guitar world magazine info at, um, Harper Collins kids or Harper sure. Collins info at target. <laughs> right. You know, right. Cause that was the world at the time. And I was like, I just need to outreach. And what we did was I said, well, <clears throat> we need to create something that they're going to be able to, you know, don't, don't, don't tell me, show me type type thing. So we created a website that was just, it was basically an homage to Monty Python. I'll never forget it. Circus aspects, like crazy things coming in, like, you know, ch -ch -ch -ch, just, it was like the TV show, uh, in, 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 um, uh, uh, interstitials came to life on a website. You know, the, um, when you hit contact us, we had a um, bearded lady on a Viking ship come out and sh shooting arrows at a monkey in an air balloon that would be throwing bananas at. And you, it was a game that you were playing online at the time when you hit contact us. That was how, and, and the, our contact info was attached to the balloon. That's, that's what it was. And we used that as our first moment of, uh, of uh, contact with these folks, right? And <clears throat> the, the, again, the reason for that was they don't know me. I don't have any of my portfolio. It's all with Kaleidoscope, right? I can't show all those. I can talk about it, but I can't show it. I can't put it up on our webpage, right? Um, and I needed to create a, con a connection. So I did that. And literally, I could see, it was fascinating. I would send it to info at HarperCollins. 45 emails later, people forwarding and forwarding and forwarding. I would get an email from like an executive uh, who I still have contact with this day that would say, come in and meet with us. Come to New York and meet with us, right? And the same thing for Target in Minneapolis and the same thing for Guitar World Magazine and the same thing for Wyatt. We sold to four, or, well, to, to three Fortune 500 companies and one a publisher that I always wanted to work with all within one week, right, in New York. And because when I got there, I could be like, oh, and here's all the stuff I did in my past life. This is the team that you're going to get. And, you know, if you trust me, we'll do something incredible for you. Right. Um, and we did, you know, and we did. And that was the start of it. And then in our first year, we did, um, I kind of missed a whole phase of that. But in our first year, we did like a million dollars of, of business, you know, on our own, which just which came through. Right? Insane. Yeah. And then, and then we went, and then we hired a team of people that helped us make all those wonderful things, right? And then, you know, carried forward and kept going. Um, but, you know, we learned a lot because we were not business owners until that point. We may have run business units. We may have run teams, whatever, but we weren't owners. You know, there's a difference, right? There's a big difference. You're, you're right. And that never occurred to me of going from how you self-taught yourself to do the technological side of things, the building, then designing, then creative directing and production into actually now being the business owner and having to sell and do the books and manage the employees and everything else. That's crazy. Yeah. And, you know, the hardest thing, honestly, was... Um, managing the employees <laughs> like we, yeah, didn't really do that. we had no clue right you know uh, you know we had i mean just the like some of the craziest stuff would happen in the course of those 13 years crazy stuff right you know and and to uh, now looking back and reflecting uh we got better at it i mean we definitely got better at it you know um but there was some i mean there were some Things that I was like, wow, I can't believe we just experienced that, <laughs> you know, or I can't believe that person just did this, right? How do we, how do we even talk to them about this, right? Okay. No, the thing I learned is, and this, this is something that eventually uh, we grew into, 
and uh, I'm in something that took a long time to kind of figure out. Uh, people are people. And at the end of the day, you just have to treat everyone individually differently because every person is different. And the challenges that we face at different times affect how we are. I have been shitty and I have been wonderful. Same as everybody else, right? Can confirm. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I uh, can't. No, no, but it's it's true. Like, and uh, there's moments I wish I could, I wish I had never done. Yeah. And there's also moments that I'm really proud of, right? So at the end of the day, you're dealing with someone that might be in one of those states of mind, you know. And uh, it's not a matter of belittling or making them feel worse. And and you know, again, as I kind of grew older, I started to realize like this person just had a bad moment. Sometimes they just have a bad moment and they need some support or they need to know that they're not going to be canned or they need to know, <laughs> they need to know that you care about them and you want what's best for them. Even if it means actually letting them go so they can find what they're actually good at. Right. Well, you know, one weird little moment that I hang on to, and I have no idea why I hang on to this one memory, but while I was doing my internship at Kaleidoscope, I had been working on something on your computer with your files. I feel yeah, like it was rock yeah. camp. I don't know. It was but rock. either way, Yes, I did something and flattened the layers of the entire. And shrunk it to this point. Yeah, <laughs> horrible. What I'm other than that, what I'm embarrassed about was, I tried desperately to find a way that it was not my fault. The receptionist was it Andrea? Was her name? Yeah. The receptionist had gone in and turned off the computer. I think at your request or my request because you weren't coming back. And I remember going to her and saying, did you do anything else to that computer? Other, I, I feel horrible to this to this day. I wish I could tell her. I'm sure she would never remember. But <laughs> I just remember how desperate I felt to be able to pin it on anybody but me because I felt like I was already doing so terrible. I still hold on to that friggin' moment today. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I, it was, I remember because I, I, I was demoing it. It was a rock camp. I, I can't remember now. I remember. I I was remember, I just remember yeah, it was some big project. The design hadn't been finished. I don't know what I was doing on your computer on anything no, in the first place. It was for Legro Legro Travel or one of the travel companies. That was, a, I don't, don't remember. I, I remember I was in the office with the CEO and we were going over and I was like, oh God, I don't have this one asset. And I called you to send me the asset. And then you tried to send me the PSD, right? Because this, again, you got to remember this was like, Early days. This is 2001. Yeah. Early 2000s. Yeah, it would yeah. have been 2003 or 2004 oh, is when yeah. I did my internship. Yeah, one of those. Yeah. So early, early days. So it's not like everyone had the web figured out or even how to use email figured out, right? So, yeah. um, anyways, it doesn't matter. But the long story short with that is, is that we've all had those moments. Yeah. Right. I'm just so ashamed that I couldn't just own it. That I was so desperate to to not be the. <laughs> That's that's what I hold on to. It's like how shitty of me. No, that's but that's everybody. Like at that time, yeah. Yeah, everybody. Everybody's had those moments. And that's the thing. And and I used to beat myself up. Like I remember when we had to do our first round of layoffs. Oh my God. To this day, still feel horrible. I still because we I felt like we were a gang, right? So I had to lay off members of my gang. I was like, what what are we doing? Right? How is this possible? You know? Um, but we had to, we were, we were, you know, we we're hitting the financial it was 2000 and I think that was 2008 when we actually had our first set of layoffs. Right. So right. a few years later and it's like, Oh, the world is, the world is now collapsing. No one's hiring uh, services. Fan fantastic stories about experiencing that in New York. That was a, that was a rough time. Right. Um, and uh, you know, we had to, we had to let people go it was super hard. Didn't do it the way I wish I had. Didn't, you know, which wish I could have maintained some of those relationships with the people I really cared about. And some of them to this day don't want to talk to me anymore. You know, it's that type of stuff. And you kind of have to swallow, um, swallow your mistakes, right. And reflect on them and try to improve for the next round. So, right. but I got to, you know, one thing that I started to realize later on is, is that at the end of the day, um, you know, there's financial reasons to do that, which, you know, no one kind of can fault you for, and then there's also like reasons where performance is an issue or personal stuff is an issue or whatever. Um, but it's really about what's best for everybody, you know, and that's, that's the thing that, you know, getting a paycheck, if you're not doing your best work, is that really good for you? No. Right. You know, so having some of those conversations and not framing in a way where you 
people some someone feels threatened or they feel like you're challenging their abilities or any of that type of stuff that's a, took some time to figure out how to do that properly you know a hundred percent and now flash forward and you've evolved again into now you're dabbling in the world of ai how how do you go from making a media company and okay. production and creative into ei uh, ai space like <laughs> ei on the brain now with all the pandemic stuff but artificial intelligence yeah how did that happen how did you how did you get there Yes, that's a tough one. So I'll tell you what happened. So we started off, when we started off our, our agency in 2006, we were innovators. We were doing crazy stuff. Like people were like, oh my God, that's why we were landing all these customers. Like, you guys do this? We don't know anybody that does this. We're going to hire you, right? It was very, very bold and trailblazing what you guys were doing. And then we got lazy. <laughs> that's, the, that's the truth we were like work was coming in easy we could have rode that ticket we could have rode that thing into the sunset until the day that we died you know when i say lazy it's not like everything was like oh it was all cookie cut or whatever but you got I, comfortable it was too comfortable and i was going bananas like i me personally i was going bananas oh boy sorry my phone is ringing hey, how do i oh sorry. so um so the reality was let me turn on the turn off the ringer here for that the reality was, was that we were, um, I was bored, right? And I, I didn't, I don't know, like me and my partner who had been together for a while, this was like, um, you know, we had different kind of views. Like he, he definitely wanted to push the limits, but also the comfort thing is not a bad thing, you know, for people that were, you know, I was, remember we started off on my credit card, right? You know, <laughs> right. So having a bit of security and knowing that, um, you know, we didn't have to worry so much about money too much. You know, we weren't paying ourselves like we didn't pay ourselves exorbitantly. We were actually still pretty, uh, pretty nimble, but we were comfortable, right? And I was like, I want to take a shot. Like, you know, I I've been part of two companies that changed how people did things around the world. You know, before before I was thirty, Kaleidoscope had done that. You know, Telepix had done that. Even my brother's company had done that. It's three companies if you look at it, right? So I didn't want to do something that was comfortable. You know, I wanted to do something that would change the world, right? So uh, what had happened was, uh, I'll never forget this, in, in 2014, I bought out my uh, business partner, you know, because uh, we were starting to have conflict in terms of risk. And that's really the main part of it. Love him. He's a really wonderful person. I'm sure we were ready to kill each other. In fact, I remember we were ready to kill each other at the time, you know, at certain points in it, but... He's a great guy, and he had done. We had we had worked together so long, but I I just I was so friggin' bored, right? And I wanted to do something, so I said to him, I said, "Listen, either I take over the company and I do something crazy, or you take it over and I go off and figure out what crazy is, right? <laughs> but something crazy needs to come back into my life where I'm not going to be happy, right? And um, you know, he was like, "Okay, because you take it," and I was like, "Okay, oh God, what did I just do, right? You know." <laughs> It's like, oh God, what am I doing now? What am I doing? And basically, I I really wanted to look at what I wanted to be when I grew up. And at the time, it was 2013, 2014. Uh, the whole world had switched. Like mobile was now the new web, right? Everyone was mobile apps because, you know, and all that stuff. So it was just becoming commercialized and people were just getting into like commoditizing mobile at that point, right? Um, and then... Uh, and then there was big data was a big play. And I was like, I want a big play. I was like, I want to do something that's going to change the world, right? So I started to look, and Oculus had just come out. And I was like, oh, immersive tech, that's pretty cool, right? I was like, Let's, let me dig into that a little bit more. I was like, oh, no, this could be the next computer. I was like, that's a very interesting play, right? Uh, but there's some players in the space already. It's very volatile, right? And then I looked at AI at the time, and I was like, okay, well, let me take a look at this, the spectrum of artificial intelligence. I was looking at three verticals, computer vision, voice technologies, uh, and then uh, sentiment, sentiment analysis. And I was like, well, this is playing into a lot of things I'm very, very much interested in, right? And there seems to be some breakthroughs that are starting to happen. And then I looked at robotics, because my history in hardware when I was younger was always a major passion. And I was like, oh, they're all intersecting. <laughs> I was like, this is, they're all coming together in a weird way because of battery life uh, was starting to have some certain types of breakthroughs. The algorithms were starting to work on 
uh, in ways that were more like instead of you remember the calculator, the original calculator, that big giant box. Well, that's kind of where AI started. And then now it was like, oh, we can, you know, the big cell phone now is, is now AI, right? You know, in terms of in terms of the, the the way that it can be processed and the opportunities it can give, right? Some of the things that were like, oh my God, this just happened, right? So I started to see how they were all intersecting in kind of weird and obscure ways, right? Between the computer vision for AR um, and the Oculus and the way that the, the spatial uh, 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 spatial computing and all those types of things all combined with all these things. And I was like, this is the new space. I was like, this is the new space. We're going to start engaging with machines, right? And this is going to become the new computer. And this can become the new interface. So basically, I went into my team. I'll never forget. We had 20 people. And I just brought out my partner, and I was going coming in to present uh, the future of the company. And I literally, uh, it, you know, the, the basic, basic crux of it was I said, we are going to be at the center of defining the human interaction experience for robotics. And all my developers went, he is completely insane. <laughs> right? We don't have a robotics. We don't have a robotics group. We don't even, like, we're all making these large-scale digital infrastructures, and now you want me to connect to firmware. Are you out of your mind, right? And I was like, we're going to do it. I was like, we're just going to do it. And we opened up a small robotics lab, uh, probably in not exactly the way I should have, but we did it. Right. But that's not a that's not a cheap venture either. Like you say, well, we opened up a small robotics lab. It's like that takes a good bit of investment, like financially and mentally. I didn't want it. Once I started in, I didn't want to do anything else. And the way the way that I kind of do things, because I have a lot of experience now, thankfully, through all those other things that happened into making things that no one's made before. And the only way to do that is to throw yourself in, talk to the best that you can identify the best people that you can, and then to do something. You just have to do something. You don't have to make the big world resounding thing that you're going to make in the end, but you have to start with something, right? Yeah. So I said, in 30 days, this team is going to make one thing. We don't care what it is. You're not even going to tell me what it is. In 30 days, you're going to present something with the robotics engineer and with, you know, and then they did. And it was, a, I remember, I think it, I remember correctly, it was a, uh, uh, it was a robot that was, it, that was, uh, uh, and it wasn't even a robot robot. Like there was no AI in it at that time. It was just like, here's a, uh, a remote control car that's connected via whatever to my app. And, uh, and it was, had, it was on two wheels. So it was doing self-balancing and we were testing, you know, how we would use an algorithm to define self-balancing in 2014 around a robot that was moving and robot used to sleep. Right. And I was like, great. Now we got 60 days, make something else. And then they made a robotic basketball. Not going to lie a robotic basketball, but that's what the team decided to do. And uh, it was uh, it was super hilarious because they were <laughs> using the phone to map where this basketball was bouncing. And I was like, I was like, okay, the product guy here is freaking out inside going, we can't sell that. No one can sell that. What are we doing here? You know, but, but at the end I was like, okay, now we're ready. That's complex, right? Uh, now we're ready to do something else. So we, we basically had little teams come up with ideas. Myself included, I was on a team. And then we mapped out what the next thing was, and I drew up this character of the Chancellor, and everyone said, that's what we want to do, right? Which was Legend Bots. That was the first step towards Legend Bots. And then we began that pursuit, which was vicious. <laughs> we outlined the things that were important for commercialization. We really focused on how not one person would engage with the machine, but how the machine would engage in story and branded character how multiple people would interact together and how they would use not just their voices and not just how the character responded with them, but how they would use apps and other devices to engage because all that fits into an ecosystem of how you would engage with new product, right? And that was in 2016. Uh, uh, we actually uh, presented and we were featured on the Discovery Channel with our prototype next to products that were fully realized, right? So really proud of it. Way ahead. Like it it I mean honestly we were I wish I wish I had access to the capital that we could have done the things that we wanted to do but I went and pitched it to a lot of venture capitalists that were like this is stupid cool and there's no way we will invest. What? Yeah. Yeah. And it was a huge like moment for me because I was like I see this. Don't you see it? 
right in my head. I was like, how do you guys not see it? Right. Very reminiscent to um, Steve Jobs and what he was trying to do and go so much further than the world was ready for at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the, the gist of it was, was we had this uh, incredible opportunity that I couldn't sell in and I didn't know why. And then I had met this really wonderful person It's become like kind of a, he was a really, really helped me see what my mistakes were. Right. And, uh, it's, he's a big, he was a big shot investor in the nineties. He was like uh, top, top 10 VCs in the world type thing, made his money. And he invited me to come out to his home in Jackson hole after he got the legend bots pitch deck. Right. And I drew what I wanted to do on the board. He went, you're crazy. He goes, this is crazy. And I was like, no, but I can see it. I know how to do this. Right. And he goes, it's brilliant. He said, but you can't sell this to anybody. He said, you can't sell this to investors. He said, you would have to put up your own money. And I remember I was like, why, why? Like, this is the thing. Like, this is going to work. This it's right here. I've mapped it. And he said, Mike, he said, um, there are no investors that invest in entertainment, robotics, and gaming at the same time. There are none. And sure enough, I went and did, I went and did my homework in that way, and I was like, I am an idiot. I can't believe I didn't see that. I was so blinded by the vision of what it could be that I, uh, that I, I couldn't see that there was, no, there was no person that would fund it. Not that there was no customer. There was no person that would fund it, right? So that was a big uh, mistake. And I actually kind of, um, after I'd went through all the pain of trying to get that thing off the ground, I shut down everything because I need to stop, right? And I stopped, uh, uh, raised, and I stopped everything. I said, I need to do some reflection, you know, to kind of, because I put a couple million bucks into trying to get that thing off the ground, you know? And and to the point of, um, if I had had the money, I would have done it myself. There's no question. I would have totally done it myself. So I took a step back, and I breathed a little bit. And I started helping other companies raise money and doing all kinds of, you know, all that type of stuff, which we were kind of doing with Raised, which turned into Brave New World. That's that's when we did the rebrand. But we were doing that for other companies too, kind of helping them, uh, you know, do those types of things. Uh, but I took more of a personal active role in one or two uh, companies I invested in and all that type of stuff. And uh, then I kind of woke up one morning and went, no, 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 I need to build. I was like, I'm a builder. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to make the next thing again, right? And there's still there's still this formula here. There's still this magic moment that intersects story, right, and technology in a way that is new that can be impactful. So I took all the lessons learned from all the mistakes I made on, on the previous project, called up a friend and said, you know, let's put in some money together, just you and me, right? He's a very substantial uh, individual and, and my partner in Snorble. Um, and he was like, yeah, whatever you want to do, I'll, I'll put a path, <laughs> right? So that, that's the benefit of years of working my butt off, right, is being able to call somebody and say, hey, you know, I want to do this thing. I don't even know what it is yet. Do you want to put in some money into it? <laughs> you know, and he was like, he's like, if you're, yeah, okay, if you're doing it, I'm in. And I was like, there's okay. not many people who could pull off that kind of uh, human equity. Yeah, but you know, and he did, and uh, we worked through some of the early ideas together and kind of concepts and stuff. And then when we came up with this for Snorble, I was like, oh, we've got it. This is now. This is the win. This is how we convert. Um, the narrative so that way the people that didn't get what was going on in legend bots now get it because everybody wants their child to go to sleep right, right. so flash forward to 2021 and yeah. you have found the market you found the technology you yeah. found your ideal customer and you actually launched this project successfully this year yeah, so on Indiegogo, so here's the thing. That was, uh, we basically came up, we decided that we were going to do something together in November 2019. That's when we decided, right? And in 18 months, we uh, basically de-risked the entire program. Uh, we brought in world-class partners and a world, built a world-class team. Uh, we raised a million dollars, which we only intended to raise a half million, right? In four months during the pandemic, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and then we launched... The Indiegogo and proved that we had product market fit. We had 200K in pre sales with that product. So we did all that, right? And that's all from 
that honestly, it's all from the mistakes that I've made <laughs> and, trying, and trying to figure out how to re-navigate and talking to people and learning all these other things, you know, that, that, uh, you know, I'm really thankful for all the experiences that I've had. And now every day that I go to work, it's like a joy. It is a joy. You know, I'm not saying it's all a cakewalk. There's some days I'm like, oh my God, right. I'm ready to lose my mind. Oh, a hundred percent. But I'm excited. We had a meeting with like our PhDs working on our algorithm where they were showing us uh, the connectivity layer between the player and we have all these different things that we're working on that are all working together to make it like incredible for the creative team to be able to execute on this stuff. Like they're able to do things way faster and way better than anybody because of what these guys are doing, right? And our tech lead on our side, like our CTO essentially, uh, it was me and him on the call yesterday and we clapped at the end of the call. And then I did a creative call where we clapped at the end of the call. Right? I love it. That's every day now. So if I can do that for the next 10 years and then hopefully sell this company or the next five years and hopefully sell this company or whatever it is, uh, that's great. And then I'll do something else and probably just as crazy. <laughs> so well, it wouldn't be you otherwise. Why, why get comfortable now? No, I'm, I am anti comfort. I think is, uh, is my nature. So, but that's what makes me happy, right? That's why you had kids. <laughs> I could use a little more comfort. I'm not. You like never want to be comfortable really again. My money. What? You'll never want to be comfortable again. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. I know. So. So from a awesome. from a scrappy Egyptian kid raised in Newfoundland to just power mogul innovating fields you never had any business being in happily married with two lovely children down in new york that is a pretty incredible trek oh and you make it sound way better than i than i would so i, I appreciate that was that. a cool <laughs> notes version like i'm <laughs> honestly sad we have this small platform because i could dive into so many more things of like even just from an entrepreneurial like to for people who are business minded or doubting themselves or afraid to get into markets that they're not fully trained in. Like there's so many things I would love to talk more about you and maybe we'll be able to do this again in the future, but your journey has been incredible and you're not even halfway to where you're going to be. I know it. Oh, and I'm just going to hitch my wagon onto that star and go along for the ride. <laughs> no, I really appreciate that. This was a super fun interview. I wish all of them could be this way, you know, this was awesome. So I'm, me too. I'm. I feel really selfish in doing this because I end up just getting to sit down and talk to people I already know. I really need to branch it out to people who I don't already have relationships with. But you're my eighth uh, eighth interview so far, and they've all been people. I'm just incredibly fortunate in my life that I know so many people who are doing these absolutely like groundbreaking, innovative, trailblazing things, and I just want to share it with the world in a different platform than it already is to share your journey about how you got where you are. Oh, I really, I really love it. And I'm really, I'm really proud of you. You're just, you branched out in so many amazing ways. <laughs> like it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible what you're doing. So thank you, buddy. This is just a real good love sesh here today. Cause it has not been great this week. So I really needed this. It was really helpful. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. And I hope you're not gone. Uh, well, I mean, behind the scenes, you've been in Nova Scotia for the last, um, few months with family members and I'm excited for you to come back. I'm glad you get to go back to New York, which is also your home and, and be there with your wife's family for a while. But I'm very much looking forward to your return and hope it's a little less restrictive pandemic time so we can actually see each other a little more. Yeah, it'll be a couple months and we'll be back there. We're trying to buy a house in Nova Scotia, which is kind of like winning the lottery right now. So um, so that's been a big challenge. I just can't believe it. Like I can't believe it either. And we're actually in the, we're looking at selling our house now just because it, it would be stupid to not look into it. And just, we, we're hoping to sell in a couple of years and build something that was smaller, more suited to us. But I mean, the fact that the market is so good right now is really forcing our hands. So if you want me to send you the listing, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about this today. And it was really actually good to fill in the gaps in my knowledge of you that I wasn't aware of over the years to see what has formulated the amazing man you have become before me. <laughs> <laughs> I like them apples. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, now you're making me blush. I'm blushing brown, so you can't see it, but I'm oh, blushing. I love it. It's a kind of mauve. I'm moving. I'm moving. <laughs> So... <laughs>
Oh, that's great. Well, I can't, I literally can't wait to see what you do next. And I'm really excited to, uh, for the world to really embrace Snorbel. Um, where can people find you if they want to read more about you online or the, or what you're doing? Uh, you can go to snorbel.com is the best way to, and if you want to get in touch with me for whatever, if you need, um, yeah, I do mentorship and help people with different things. So if there's a challenge that you're looking to overcome or figure out and feel free, feel free to reach out. I, I already do that for a number of folks. Oh, that's fantastic. And I'll get your email for that to include when eventually this goes live. I'm trying to give myself a mile marker of hitting 10 videos, and then I'm going to get them edited and look at the release schedule. So when I know when that's happening, I'll give you a heads up and uh, <laughs> you can just be aware of it's going to happen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia. It was great chatting with you. Oh, you too. Tell Dina I said hello. And uh, I'm sure the kids don't care, but tell them I said hi too. And <laughs> hopefully we'll get to hang out and do some fun stuff uh, in the next couple of months. I hope so. All right. I love you, buddy. Love you too. See ya. Bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and share with a friend. Tune in next week for Olympic weightlifting champion Shannon Tails.